We are talking to um, uh, the inimitable Momodu Sabali, uh, new campaign manager of the country's biggest opposition party, the United Democratic Party, the UDP. Uh, Sabali is uh, with us I mean, officially up to 10 o'clock, but if needs be, uh, we will keep talking until um, he runs out of something to say, which I don't think will ever be possible. <laughs> How will this affect your new role as UDP campaign manager and how you approach the local government elections? Well, I think it's actually set the tone for uh, my new role because, um, no exaggeration, Peter, for people send me messages on Facebook. I was at this political party. Now I'm joining UDP because of this incident. I was NPP, literally. Now I'm joining UDP. Really? NPP, yes. I, I, I actually have the message here. I can show it to you. And, uh, and I've not gone through all these messages. Even some opposition parties, and I'll not mention those opposition parties. That must scare them dead, if you like. You, you know, uh, NPP, they know Murusabali. They know how I do my politics. Baro knows what's going. The moment I was appointed campaign manager, one of their top executives called me and said, it's my brother. But you know how this country is Peter, and that's why... We should avoid this unnecessary drama. But you are Baro's brother, yet he would sit there and allow you to languish in, uh, you know, You see, for my days. sister in their pa is in their party, my cousins, one of their top executives, and okay, uh -huh. we all prayed for you to get this position, but please don't, don't break our party, don't break NPP. Before my detention, I had a political parties allied to Baro, their national women's president ready to join UDP. Uh, a top NPP chairman in the hinterland who is actually had at least a thousand followers is ready to join the UDP. And I've not even started my politics yet. So this thing has, uh, and, and that's why we, we, I am personally grateful to the entire country and UDP is grateful because the Gambians did not sit back and say, this is uh, UDP, Usain Udaba thing. They said, this is Gambia. We don't want the wrongs of the past to be repeated. So this has actually uh, amended some uh, broken relationships. Because, you know, in the heat of the political field, sometimes people's uh, emotions can be ruffled. But some of those people, they just came back. People who would be insulting me and criticizing me, they said, no. I mean, despite our differences, uh, we in this together, we defending Sabali. And uh, this is a blessing. You know, I, I have a, a senior friend who came to visit me. He said, people talk about collateral damage. But uh, we, we UDP, we're getting collateral benefit out of this, and we'll make the most out of it. And you know, it, it's very unfortunate, Peter, mm -hmm. that the occasion to use TikTok that was about lightening up the message to politics, and they use this and create this unnecessary drama. You know, my first political act for UDP as campaign manager was going to be a set settle, because there's a group within the UDP called the AI Campaign Task Force mm -hmm. that wanted to come and do a set settle opposite the party leader's uh, residence. That's the strip from the American embassy down yes. to Pipeline Mosque. Kairaba Avenue. Yeah, I was going to join them. That was going to be my first political act that very Saturday. You know, and they deprived me of that opportunity. You know, that was supposed to be the signal that there is a new dimension to my politics. Exactly. I was just about to ask, <laughs> how will your, you know, how will you rebrand, if you like, the UDP? And how will your approach to electioneering differ from what was? Because for the presidential election, for instance, mm -hmm. most people just assumed mm -hmm. that this was UDP time. Yeah. But of course, I mean, the result proved everybody wrong, if you like. Well, I guess lessons were learned. I think uh, even before I came into the party, UDP was on the path of uh, rebranding. Mm -hmm. And it was quite clear, even the, the, the first Congress after the change of government, mm -hmm. you could see it. So UDP was actually on the path of rebranding. If anything, maybe I'll just add flavor to it. And uh, I'm going to be working with uh, Mayor Talib Ahmed Ben Souda, who is the National Organizing Secretary, and of course with the guidance and support of the party leader and secretary general, if you look at what uh, my very good sister, my special sister, Mayor Rohi Maliklu, is doing Banyul. I love her politics, you know. Sometimes we don't even discuss that, but I just sit down and say, I love what my sister is doing. What's, what's so special about what she's doing? Well, you, you see Rohi championing uh, women's empowerment causes, youth empowerment, you know, and giving an international dimension to these issues. Recently she was on BBC. Because, Peter, listen. And people don't know this about Mamadou Sabali. I take my politics as service to God. Because in this process, I am meeting people, uh, some old men. 
they hold my hands for one hour. We love you. We eat. We love what sometimes just my WhatsApp audio is transforming lives. So Rahim Ali Glow, what she is doing beyond winning elections, she is building future leaders. She's building future mayoresses, future female presidents. So, so, and, and she, when Rohi goes into the space there in Banjul, mm -hmm. sometimes you don't even see her in yellow. It's like Banjul coming together, rallying behind, but Rohi is our Rohi, first female mayor ever. So you have all of this, and that's why, Peter, I'm telling you, UDP was already on a rebranding path. The only thing is Allah has blessed me with communication skills, and like I said, I'm connected with everybody and with the passion. I think, uh, really, uh, politics has changed in this country forever, inshallah. Communication skills you have in abundance, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and not just that. Uh, we'll yeah. talk about your, you know, your uh, economic skills, if you like, as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, your expertise as an economist. Mm -hmm. So, how are you working with uh, Talib Ahmed Ben Souda? And um, define the two roles for me. He is administrative secretary for social, well, or, 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 national organizing, national organizing secretary, yeah. and your campaign manager. Yeah. You know. So, what's your role as campaign manager? What's his role? as um, organizing secretary? Well, the, the, the two roles are fused somehow because exactly. we are... They sound, they sound similar to me. Yes, so. yes. And, and, and it's okay because there was a campaign manager before me and he was working smoothly with uh, Talib. Mm -hmm. So Talib has all these uh, uh, regional organizers and they're working with him. And I have all these... Uh, UDP is the most structured. Our party is even better structured than the Gambia government. I can tell you that for free. So I have all these regional campaign managers, constituency campaign managers ward campaign managers, village campaign managers that I'm working with. But we, you are just sharing some of your secrets now. They will go around and start, you know, <laughs> well, establishing those structures. But I well. told you we are on a path of uh, rebranding. And mm -hmm. so before they catch up, we've gone to the next step. <laughs> so <laughs> they are going to the moon, we are going to Jupiter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? so, so we are all in the same committee called the uh, National Campaign and Organizing Committee with Talib heads. I am there as the secretary and the Talib's deputy is here, my good brother, Ibrahim Adiba. And the, 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 I'm not going to go into the details. Like you said, we, we don't want them copying us. And, and of course, uh, we've seen what Talib has been doing. He's got experience in this. He's been in this for, for two years. And uh, for me, I'm like that free player in the team who can go anywhere. That's what I've been doing for the past two years. You know, I'm no protocol. I go anywhere I want to go and do my politics. And uh, Talib has gathered a lot of uh, experience. He's gone around the country. And we've seen, of course, the good work he's doing in KMC. And, and I see Talib how he's uh, connecting with some of the minority groups and uh, bringing them closer. You, you see Talib uh, organizes programs. By default, you see Nene Freda Gomez, who is not uh, UDP. You see MC Cham Junior. So I'm going to be uh, working with Talib. And actually, he came and visited me. Uh, at PIU and get, give us our first opportunity to have our first official meeting on what we will do. I will not share the secrets. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, before the, the, the Congress, mm -hmm. there was talk that, I mean, you brought up his name, there was talk that <laughs> Talib Ahmed Ben Souda uh, was aspiring for the leadership uh -huh. of, um, of the UDP. In effect, he was going to contest the leadership against uh, Hussein Udabo. It didn't turn out. I mean, where did that talk come from? Well, and uh, what effect has it had on, on, on the party? Well, your guess is good, as good as mine. Uh, personally, I've never heard Talib mention this. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in every party, even outside the country, you'll have the Democratic Party, you have different segments of that sure. party. It's, it's just natural. So I think some misunderstanding happened, and uh, we were able to trash it out. And uh, actually for me, especially, we just had the uh, inaugural meeting of the new executive, and uh, people spoke to each other, you know. And, uh, and Tali, when we met at the PIU, we spoke heart to heart. I said, you are my brother. We are going to work together. I mean, there are certain challenges, but I think you and I, if we speak to our people, we'll be able to trash out some of these uh, little uh, ruffles here and they bring the party together and uh, what are some of those ruffles well l like y you just said something that some people accuse talib of something yes. and talib has cleared the air he's, he's made himself understood like we had this inaugural meeting we all spoke everybody who had any because you know sometimes if you far away from somebody you could have certain assumptions about him when you come closer or when you have a dialogue, because this happens sometimes. If I have suspect something about 
Peter's attitude towards me, I go to buy selling Koli boys, I go to buy Bonla boy, Lilegli, and then Peter talks to buy. But once I sit down with Peter, what's the problem? The problem is resolved. So the, whatever misunderstandings were there, were thrust out. And later, like I, when we had the first inaugural meeting, I think all the misunderstandings, whatever, and they were not major, became a blessing in disguise. This party is more united today than we've ever been. We are one family under His Excellency, our party leader and Secretary General, Lawyer Usain Dabo. So the UDP lost the presidential election. Uh, Alleg allegedly. Okay. Didn't, um, you know, win the, the, the most seats uh, during the uh, National Assembly elections. Why is it important that the UDP should emerge from the forthcoming local government elections the strongest of the contesting parties? Well, because of the clear circumstances, the election results, as far as I, Momodu Sabali, am concerned, are still disputed. Not only by the UDP, but also the GDC. Which of the elections? Presidential? The or presidential national? elections disputed. And as far as I'm concerned, me personally speaking for myself, mm -hmm. I still want to go to the bottom of that. I still want to question, interrogate, challenge the National Electoral Register because it's flawed and we all know it, as testified to by a, a, a National Assembly member in the Republic of Senegal. People of DEA Jao felt vindicated. We said that something was wrong with the, with the electoral process. So that happened and Barrow and NPP, I think they thought UDP was dead. Really, the, 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 the impact was huge on the party. But then, by the grace of God... Well, before uh, the election, he said he was going to kill effectively the kill the UDP and yeah. retire yeah. Usain Udabo. And, and I think he meant it. And I think he meant it. But you know what the Quran says? Uh, they, they plan and Allah also plans. And the best of planners is Allah. So I think Barrow could have done that. Wallahi, I mean, to, to, be, to be honest and objective... But stuff happened after the election. Some of us, we went back to our people constantly bombarding Peter, literally thousands of audio messages in Mandinka, in Wolof, even translated them in Fula. I personally tell him, UDP is still the biggest party. We have the majority. We are not going anywhere. We need to be resilient, you know, at some point to encourage the use. I even use Sadio Mane in the, in the Cup of Nations and how he was able to lift the entire Senegal out of the challenges and the, the youth started getting motivated. Ibrahim Adiba was out there, you know, and then the National Assembly elections came. And again, Barrow and his team went after Mumuru Savali, their biggest problem. They did something that was never done in the history of the country, rejecting somebody's nomina nomination at the very point that he is uh, he's submitting his nomination and we know it was pre-planned. So when that happened, of course, there was a scuffle in, in, in Brikama, you know, young people clashing with the paramilitary. We went to court. I think that process re-energized our party. Because when we lost the election, and we know there was foul play, a lot of people practically gave up. They said, there is no point in politicking again. There is no point in voting again, because you're going to vote, and the whole world expected UDP to win. We lost our people were deflated, they were discouraged, some said they left politics, but we kept the, the, the pressure to bring the people back. So when that rejection came, and I went to court. I knew the courts would not give me what I deserve. I knew it. But I insisted on going to court, and I insisted on full-scale media war. That energized our people. On the, at the 11th hour when I was rejected, I endorsed Mohammed Kante, the independent candidate who got our backing and still our people were angry some of the party supporters they, they, they were not going to vote because there is no use in voting a group of women in Nyani Barajali mm -hmm. who adopted me as father they swore that they were not going to vote somebody had to call me from Barajali at night for me to speak to them why don't you want to vote they said your rights have been abrogated and your right is our right in Mandinka these are women farmers we are not going to vote I said no if you do that, you make the oppressors to win. I said, the only way you can bring back my rights is to go out and massively vote for all UDP candidates. That way we can use the legal process and all the democratic processes. So this is a party that's showing its re resilience, rebounding onto the scene. So this is like a process. We've not reached the climax yet, almost on cruise control. And that is why Anbaro is helping my politics. Rampant corruption, minister taking money, giving to his wife to go and watch Foyantu and then admits and says we will refund.
We've not seen it. Meanwhile, prices are going up. No, he, he has refunded. We, well, we, we, we have seen evidence. Doesn't make it right anyway. It's still a crime that's I, not been prosecuted. I, I heard uh, when I was coming on your program, the analysis, I think, is coach. Uh, corruption cases not being prosecuted. Mm -hmm. Uh, central bank being hacked and uh, people not having their we'll salaries we'll come, on we'll time. Come to that. that's, no, that's, I'm, I'm just yeah. analyzing the political scene because yeah. you challenged me. That, how do we win the local government yeah. election whilst we lost uh, miserably at the presidential and uh, Barrow has the So I'm telling you, so Barrow is making my life easy. The killing of the 66 children and then Barrow laughing at the country saying, yeah, the health minister is doing a good job. Gambians are not happy. We are resilient. We are rebounding. Barrow is uh, making it easy by creating unnecessary problems. We are going to sweep the entire country in the local gov government elections, inshallah. Sweep. Sweep. Quite not to cut on, inshallah. Okay, after the elections, I'll, uh, I'll remind you of that word. <laughs> uh, we are getting text messages for, for you, but we yeah. really need to, uh, um, you know, just build on what you just started. Yes. Um, the, the economic management skills, you know, of, of, of this government. Or the lack um, thereof. Or the lack thereof, indeed, yes. Um, the past two years have been very difficult for Gambians. You could say even, you know, more, more than two years. But um, with the advent of COVID, everything first was blamed on COVID, then uh, Ukraine, Russia came, and life is getting more and more difficult uh, for Gambians. And um, 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 uh, surveys, studies have shown that we are getting poorer every day. But we also listen to, uh, um, you know, the Christian leaders saying that it cannot be the will of God that only a tiny few would thrive when the majority of Gambians are suffering, living in poverty and misery. Amos and Hosea. <laughs> <laughs> the economic situation of the Gambia during the past 12 years, the past 12 months, possibly 12 years too, um, as seen by uh, Momodu Sabali. Well, Peter, I'm not surprised at all. At the turn of the year, by January, after the elections, I made a post on uh, Facebook, and I know lawyer Asan Martin was quoting it constantly at the Pandari Star FM uh, Wake Up Gambia show. I said, uh, uh, Gambia, fast in your seatbelts. We are going into the macroeconomic doldrums, and the situation is going to get worse. And I've said this in audios, literally more than 100. The economic situation is going to get worse. And, uh, and I, and I <laughs> I've, I've written, Peter, more than a dozen open letters to the finance minister on the macroeconomic situation of this country way before COVID, Russia, and Ukraine, way before all of these problems. Uh, economics is a science. It's a social science, but it's, it's so complex now that... Peter, if I show you the uh, mathematical models that we use now to analyze the economy, you will think it's a, it's a model for, for a space rocket. That's, that's how rugged the science is. Macroeconomic management is just based on one principle. Cut your coat according to your cloth. Don't spend beyond your earnings. But this is the one rule that the government disrespects more than any other rule. You're spending more than the revenue that you are earning, and you are borrowing unsustainably. If you borrow and spend that money responsibly, it brings back uh, uh, positive effects. But you borrow, and then you start organizing tours and foreign trips and you know, buying luxury cars. You are not only making life difficult for the current generation because uh, in, uh, the debt stock will rise, inflation will rise, your, your currency will depreciate. And this, Gambia is a very unique, peculiar country. We are a small open economy. And we import practically everything that we use. So what other countries like Nigeria can afford, mistakes they can afford, we cannot. Because the moment you start spending beyond your earning, inflation rises, what happens, and as you are boring, interest rates are rising. Uh, Peter wants to build a uh, uh, TV station here. He goes, interest rates are high. Yeah. Peter's adverts become expensive. Life becomes expensive for Gambians. So whilst your, the, all this inflation is happening, your currency is depreciating. If pig milk was $40 this week, it was. Now it will become 50 yeah. But, you know, like I said in one of my uh, letters to the finance minister, the, the author, Ola Rochimi, the gods are not to blame. You know, it, it, it's, it's our own fault. So this is what they've been doing. I remember when they did the 50% salary increase, and I said, this is wrong. It's unsustainable. It's going to cause macroeconomic instability. Some public servants insulted me. But what happened, immediately that happened, what happened, they hiked the tax rate on Julbrew
by more than 700 percent and destroyed an entire yeah. industry. Yeah. People lost their jobs. Yeah. So I mean, like it, 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 it's 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 so sad. I've spoken about all of these things. So when we come to a situation where they say COVID or the economy was destroyed before COVID, before Ukraine, port charges were hiked up way before COVID, way before Ukraine. Tourism was destroyed by their this all inclusive. And to add insult to injury, they had this uh, twenty dollar security port thingy. I mean, uh, mistake upon mistake, error upon error, is what brought us here. Now you come. Last year, what did they do? They did a revised budget, right? To increase expenditure again. I said, you, are, you cannot foot the bill that you have, but you want to spend some more. You are worsening the problem. And, it's and then they bring this other budget. Inflation. Peter, I've done my... Go and to also them. increase uh, National Assembly members' uh, allowances and wages, yeah, that's especially that of the, uh, the Speaker. <laughs> Well, the speaker with the robbing allowance. You know, God does not mean yeah. They wanted to say robbing. They yeah, said know, robbing because it's robbery. Everybody picks on that exactly. Well, it's their own doing. Uh, exactly. So, so you, you, you come up with a budget yeah. as if the problems you've created. You know, Peter, just the collapse of Julbro should be a scar on yeah. the conscience of this government. Costing 200 Gambians their jobs. Their jobs. And you know, Peter, the ripple, the ripple effect on, on the tourism industry, yeah. you know, tourists and their beer. Yes, absolutely. You know, so... so it's not only 200, maybe it's 1,000, because tourists, if they can't have beer, they'll go somewhere else where they can have beer. A lot of more young people losing jobs in the tourism industry, creating extra crime in the society. So they come to the budget. One would have thought that they would try to correct some of the wrongs of the past. You have inflation at more than 13%. If you go to the time series of the Gambia's economy, for the past 20 years, inflation has never reached 11%. So they're creating a new record. So what we know from macroeconomic theory, especially if you are from the Milton Friedman School of Thought, uh, Monetary Economics, if you increase your expenditure beyond your revenue, you will borrow, your, 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 your economy will be unstable. Mm -hmm. But at inflation at 13%, one would have thought that they would bring down expenditure. They increase expenditure by more than 13%. When the minister himself is telling us that revenues are going down and even the donors are apparently losing confidence, grants are all also going down. So you're making the situation worse. So 2023 is going to get worse. Inflation will be higher. Interest rates uh, for, for borrowers are going to be higher. And you know what's bad about inflation, Peter? Businessmen, even those who are not educated, they know the economy better than me. If inflation is 13% and your interest rate, your deficit rate is 10%, if you keep your money in the bank, you are losing instead of gaining. So they're not going to save. What we know in economics is savings is quality investment. The money that is saved is the money that is borrowed and invested. If investment does not happen, how do we create jobs in this country? How do all these thousands of graduates get jobs when government is practically not hiring anything? Then you have some of these bad policy decisions like the dollar decision for foreign currency denominated accounts. People deposited their money, their hard-earned cash into their accounts all of a sudden because of and the dollar was depreciating because of the mismanagement of the economy but they came and punished innocent gambians peter you have a thousand dollars yes that's fine but we are not going to when you want to withdraw it we'll give you dollars at a rate that's actually lower than what the market is giving oh wow so what's happening people that, will get discouraged that is people will keep their monies in in their houses and that's not good for the economy mm, mm. so it's bad i repeat my words fasten your seat belts i have text messages for you but i cannot um you know uh, start reading the text messages without asking uh, uh for your take on the acute kidney injury wahala because that was one of the <sighs> biggest talking points of uh, 2022 to lose 70 innocent lives how do we deal with that situation uh having lost these children just because we whether knowingly or unknowingly give them poison to drink absolutely you know as a uh, cough cough syrups peter it's it's really bad and again i'm loath to say it but i have to say i warn the entire country that with dr amadou samate at health the health situation is going to get worse. He has the, he has the full backing of the president. Well, only the president, and, and that's good enough, because when I said that, the majority of Gambian social media came and attacked me. 
Now when they talk, I said, I told you. He doesn't have the leadership skills or neither the acumen to manage the health sector. You had divisions within the health sector, nurses versus uh, public health officials, doctors versus public health officials. And I made audios on this. And I know Dr. Samadhi listens to my audios. And I know he's listening to me. You cannot divide a house and expect it to stand. The Bible told us that house will not stand. When this, K, this K, AKI thingy, you know it's a public health issue. But what was happening in the past, public health officials were on strike because they felt discriminated. Somebody was keeping malice with these people. And it's not just that, Peter. And I want to thank the Foroya newspaper for, for the work they're doing in this country. There was an oil spill in Mandinari, between Lamin and Mandinari. Mm -hmm. 70,000 liters. It went into our food chain because we're getting our fish, our crabs, our yohos from this. And they well, swept it under the carpet. All of which I eat, by the way. You see, and, 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 and these are all public health issues. So the public health cadre were not happy. They were not able to do that. So when the AKI happened, what did they do? A doctor did a press release about crossing C-R-O-S-S-I-N-D, prostomal tables instead of tablets. You're advising the public. And they all say, a priori, they say, this is the cause. And then, no, it, it's really heartbreaking, Peter. And, okay, let's say we can blame each other for everything. But when situation happens, you cannot... You cannot make it not to happen. So we seek solutions. But now the problem with this government, that is where they even mess up even more. Instead of taking responsibility and apologizing to the country, the president says his health team is doing a good job. The president says in his speech that this is contaminated medicine from India. Some little guy from MCA comes to say it's because of the flooding. This is the biggest, biggest mockery of victims in this country. Even the past regime never did this. And then the people, MCA, who should take responsibility for this, are part of the people who are supposed to investigate this, Peter. This is very sad. This is cold-blooded. And Gambian children don't deserve this. Gambian mothers don't deserve this. Unfortunately, the message I'm getting from India is that they kind of, so to speak, defend the Indian pharmaceuticals. I said, why wouldn't they if Baro is defending his health minister and, and, and his health team? Uh, my friend lost his daughter yesterday, a, a, a one-year-old daughter. I don't know what killed her. Allah knows best. But my man went back to his AKI thing. I'm not saying that that's what, that's okay. what caused it. But <laughs> it's scary because yeah. I, have, I have a baby. Yeah. You know. Well, I'm not making them anymore. <laughs> uh, almost 13 minutes past uh, 10 o'clock. We have to end. I mean, it's, 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 it's fun having you in the studio and I'm yeah. enjoying our conversation. But uh, well, since you. we ask people to send in text messages, yeah. let's start dealing with those and hopefully we will finish by half past 10. Good morning, Peter. I like Sabali very well, but his problem is Sabali does not act or behave uh, like a minister. Sabali was one time handling the highest ministerial post. He needs to comport himself as a former minister and stop the childish behavior, especially on social media. Can't he learn from Dr. Njoguba? Dr. Njoguba did politics for NPP massively and in a very professional and diplomatic manner. And that has earned Dr. Ba the same respect as a former minister. The word or message is, let Sabali change his wild or aggressive way of politics as a highly educated someone or a former minister. Thank you. Your reaction? Well, the point is, uh, this, this is the problem with some of the people who observe me. They see me as a former minister. I just see a young Gambian ghetto you doing his thing. And I am a graduate from uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson School of Thought, Self-Reliance, Henry David Thoreau. We, 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 we don't want to have anything to do with conformity, and all of my mentees are within the school of thought. We are supposed to change things, like Steve Jobs would say. You know, the unruly ones, the, the rebels, they are the ones who change the wall. We are here to change the wall. We are not conforming to anything. Disruptors. Absolutely, without a doubt. All right. Uh, text, <laughs> text message. Uh, since the Supreme Islamic Council has secured your release, why not, why, not, why not let bygones be bygones rather than resorting to court? And this is coming from Ali Umbai at the Serekunda market. Good to know that people at the market are listening. Well, uh, 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 I salute them all at the market there. I hope the price of uh, onions. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's quite interesting, Actually, some are Peter. suggesting that, um, you know, there was a time when it was coming down, but some are suggesting it's going up again. The price of Jabo. Yeah. Jabo is onions. Not so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's gone high. I think Barrow... That's the, what I'm saying. They're giving him the wrong... There was a time when, uh, you know, <laughs> it was going down and government was, uh, you know, taking um, 
uh, platitudes for it, but it's going up again. It's up. So, so on the Alumbai guy at the market, like, like I said, I think maybe he didn't hear when I was responding to your question on that. It's nothing personal. I'm not bitter. I'm not angry. But lessons have to be learned. And this is not just about Mobulu Sabali. This was an idea and a principle that Gambians came together on across the religious or political line. So I cannot arrogate myself to the position of having to decide what's going to happen. Right. I'll have to consult everybody. Right. Good, good, mo good, good morning, Mr. Gomez. Uh, please ask Mr. Sabali what will be his take if the government should use the Islamic Council to prevent him from uh, suing them to court? Well, like I said again, um, it's not going to be me. And uh, if my supporters and my family should take that decision, I'm not saying that's what they would do. I don't want to preempt them. Uh, if they want me to go to court, nobody can stop me from going to court with all due respect to all the players. Like I said, it's nothing personal. It's not about vengeance. I'm perfectly cool. Lessons have to be learned. We don't want this to happen to other young politicians in this country. All right. Hello, Peter. How are you? I say assalamu alaikum to Mr. Sabali uh, knowing, um, and letting him know that all good people who passed, most of them were jailed. So just keep on. Be patient and continue your Dawa, or should that be dua? <laughs> is it dawa? Well, I guess both. <laughs> okay. What's dawa? Well, dua, uh, dua is prayer. Dua is prayer. Dawa is calling people to, uh, okay. to God. So. Okay. Well, da dawa is the one that is here. D-A-A-W-A-H. I, 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 I do both. Okay. <laughs> I do both. All right. Morning, gentlemen. Uh, happy for Sabali for gaining his freedom, albeit through the intervention of SIC. Is it legally correct to arrest anybody without a warrant uh, from the court? It seems the police continues to violate the law of the land irresponsibly. Well, just tell him the Attorney General is violating the law of the land. How can you blame the police? This government is not interested in, in, in rule of law. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, Peter. Sabali's interview is full of sound and fury signifying nothing. I can assure you and your listeners that NPP has the most comprehensive network of party structures than UDP and any other party in this country. Sabali will be shocked with the way NPP will shake the political landscape in the campaigns for this local government. Do I have to respond? Well, I mean, it's... Well, it's, it's we, we've, we've had the echoes from their Congress. It's not sounding very good. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> All right. uh, good morning, Uncle P. Please remind Sabali that we remove Jame with the absence of Dabo. We'll easily remove Baro if Dabo did not contest. I think the UDP should start working on that. We love our Dabo. He stays. The Congress just elected him party leader and secretary general this time for four years, not even two. And Dabo loves him too. Mm -hmm. I know some of, some of it is out of love. Dabo loves everybody and is willing to serve everybody. And inshallah, Dabo will become president of the Republic of the Gambia. Inshallah. Mm -hmm. By the grace of the good Lord. Okay. <laughs> good morning, Uncle Peter. Does Mr. Sabali believe in the 13% inflation? I believe it's understated. The way things are, I feel inflation is at 60%. Well, uh, I think that's a very good point, Peter. The point is that when I speak about economics as a professional economist, I don't, uh, I just stick to the, 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 the actual data that I have. So I would not say what he said, but it is plausible that inflation is actually understated by the government authorities and is higher than what they're saying. That is possible. Good morning, Peter. A bag of onions is $1,200 as at now. That is $1,200. I hope it doesn't reach 1,500 before Ramadan or later. It's, it's very possible it will reach it. I'm not praying for it, but Goodness. inflation is going to be much higher in this country. Goodness gracious. Yeah. 1,200 dollars. Hmm. Hi, Peter. Good morning. My question to uh, Mumudu Sabali. During your detention at the PIU headquarters, is there any time they intimidated or tortured you to take your statement? This is coming from Sidiko Suno from Faraba Banta. I was not intimidated, I was not tortured, but, mm -hmm. you know, we have to put these things under context. If a police force comes and says, we're inviting you, then said, we've been asked to arrest you, then you go to PIU, you get this uh, mammoth deputy IG in a black car staring at you. It's Mamadou Sabal, you can't intimidate me, but if it happens to somebody else, a younger person with less experience, the situation was not good. Mm -hmm. Yes. Good morning, West Coast Radio. Honorable Sabali is the type we need right now. He's bold and straightforward with his thinking and his thoughts. Telling him to be quiet is the same way of telling a father in his household to be quiet. The man is representing the most respected and uh, well-established uh, political party. Apparently, not everybody wants you, wants 
a toned down version of Momodu Sabali. You know, Peter, there's something going on in this country, and that's why mm -hmm. I, I respect both sides' opinion. Mm -hmm. But I am me, I decide what I want to do. Even some of my supporters, they say, no, maybe you should tone down change in politics mm -hmm. in Africa. Mm -hmm. It cannot be in a hush hush tone. Mm -hmm. I am not part of the hush hush nation and I have that hashtag. Mm -hmm. Hush hush, Gambia hashtag. We are changing this country and the young people are ready. We are going to speak our mind. Mm -hmm. you know. uh, somebody who goes to the market, because uh, this is from a woman. Uh, Uncle Peter, a bag of onions is now 1,300. I'll take the woman's version, and, Peter. And, and 75. I trust the woman. She goes to the market. <laughs> Almost, I mean, th this guy is saying 1,500 by Ramadan. Well, didn't I say it's, tell you it's possible? Already 30, it's already almost 1,400. It, it, and it's uh, given the way things, uh, mm -hmm. you know, go up in this country on a near daily basis, maybe by next week it's already 1,500. Uh, good morning, Mr. Gomez. Please ask Mr. Sabali what will be his take if the government should use the Islamic Council to, preventing, to prevent him from... Okay, uh, we had this one before. The person is only identifying himself. Is, uh, I should just speak and clarify the Supreme Islamic... Council's position on this. They are here to mediate, okay. but they also said they're calling for respect of human rights mm -hmm. and freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that would mean allowing uh, <laughs> Sabali, you know, to, to be Sabali, you know, <laughs> as long as um, he doesn't um, plunge the country in chaos. Um, please tell Sabali to respect the law of this country. What laws did you break? Amen. Tell him he said amen. That's why we are here, so we can speak to people under the law and so people do politics under the law. Tell Baro to respect the laws of the country and Adawda Jara. That's what we should be saying. What laws are they not respecting? <laughs> what laws are they not respecting? Well, they Baro. just detained me illegally for 10 days and every lawyer knows that the court order was a mess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good morning, sir. Mr. Sabali was in finance. Suggestions that he was collecting money on Jamie's orders. Is he any better than the ones currently there? Well, I never collected money on Jamie's orders when I was at finance anyway. That, was, that is wrong. I didn't even have access to Jamie when I was at finance. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning, Uncle Peter. Please remind Sabali about what Alma Mittal said before the general elections. In politics, one should not talk too much. If not, he will swallow uh, his own words. Well, if you don't want to talk, then don't get into politics. That's our job, to talk. Politics is about talking? Absolutely, without a doubt. Happy New Year to all listeners of uh, WCR Coffee Time, where somebody doing my job. Happy for Mr. Sabali to, to be in good shape. Government should look into the continuous increment of our food commodities. If a UDP government were to come to power, how would they tackle this cost of living crisis? It's, it's lingered on for years. Now, absolutely. Uh, and Peter, to be honest, mm -hmm. the global macroeconomic situation mm -hmm. is uh, challenging. Mm -hmm. But the point is, like I said, economics <laughs> is complex when we do our analysis. Mm -hmm. But the basic principles are simple. Do not get yourself into unnecessary frivolous expenditures that you cannot sustain. So the UDP's approach at the get-go would be to try to balance the budget, quote-unquote, but balancing the budget doesn't necessarily mean you spend exactly what you have. But if you are borrowing, there are thresholds and macroeconomic parameters that you would look at that will tell you this is what you can borrow without necessarily doing damage to your economy. A UDP government will not give $150,000 in the past to Usenu Dabo at State House, and these are what things that are cre uh, creating the, all these uh, inflationary pressures. A UDP government will not come before election and promise a 100% increase in salary that they know they cannot sustain. That's what Barrow is doing. So we are going to be a responsible government that will respect the tax money that we are collecting and prioritize sectors like agriculture, health, education, rather than buying expensive cars for ministers and taking political hooligans to UN General Assembly spending like millions of dollars. UDP government will not do that. The first step here is to close the valves. Excessive expenditure, rampant and outrageous procurement fraud is what is destroying this country. UDP norms are already challenging that in the assembly. When we come, the curve will be smooth. We'll be all on an equal playing ground. Uh, earlier, you couldn't help, um, you know, taking a swipe at the IEC. I mean, mm -hmm. what needs to be done uh, in the area of electoral reform? If, as far as I'm concerned, the entire electoral register should be abrogated and we go into fresh registration that will allow Gambians 
with the right to vote, to have voters' cards, and to strike out all the foreign voters who were registered. And also, I think uh, Ali Umar Manjai should retire. I think the man is old. And I think the IEC itself should build their capacity. And uh, because uh, e election processes are quite complex, what needs to be done also, and the IEC cannot do it alone, our security forces need to be independent and get out of politics. Because foreigners are crossing into the Gambia to vote because immigration opened the borders on, on, on the night before election beyond the regular. I mean, this is, this is outrageous, Peter. It's a collective effort. It's not just IEC. I'm criticizing them. I maintain my opinion on them. They can reform, but the security forces have to reform. And the citizens should also take responsibility. You know why UDP won a lot of seats? in the parliamentary election, because yeah. our boys went to the borders and stopped some of these foreigners, foreigners coming to, to vote. So that is not just UDP's responsibility. And a former minister said UDP should have done more after the uh, registration process. But it's not just UDP. The country does not belong to UDP. I mean, we are a party, but, and we are, our doors are open. Usainu Dabo's doors are, I think we should work together. Peter. This is not about you and me. Mm -hmm. You've been there, done it. Radio Gambia, Deutsche Welle. You mentioned you have your own radio. Mumudu mm Sabali, -hmm. Young Earth, I am Masha Allah, Sufi Emon Sahamune. We should do this for our children, Peter. I'm trying not to go beyond half past the hour, <laughs> even though, you know, there's still, uh, you know, many more questions that come from. Yes, indeed, uh, whoever said the UDP should have done more, mm -hmm. meaning they should have done better mm -hmm. at, um, you know, the previous two elections, mm -hmm. I concur. Um, after the presidential election, and I had Sila and um, Sankare here, I told them to their face mm -hmm. that they should not take for granted that the 52 percent mm -hmm. that um, voted for, um, uh, for Barrow all believed in his program or were all uh, NPP. Um, there was this perception mm -hmm. that the UDP mm -hmm. was too aggressive a party, and um, they allowed people to just insult, mm -hmm. particularly other, other, other tribes. Why is this tag of an insulting party, you know, following the UDP? I mean, okay. earlier on you said that, you know, you were going to, um, you know, to ensure that um, whoever was found insulting in the name of the UDP mm -hmm. would be expelled from the party immediately. Your leader said this at the last Congress. Just a minor correction. If I say that people will say you should, UDP should do more, I know, I'm not talking about the campaigning and everything, like trying to avoid electoral fraud and to stop all these electoral okay. That's not UDP's sole responsibility. No, not at all. It's not our all. collective responsibility. It's my, resp it's my exactly. responsibility too. That's what I meant. In terms of UDP's politics, I think we did the right thing, sold the right message, knocked the right doors, uh, pushed the right buttons, and I believe the majority of legally registered Gambians voted for UDP. Electoral fraud is what prevented us from be getting into government. Mm -hmm. Regarding the aggressive uh, label on Insulting, the party, you know, whatever uh, well, whatever. Mm -hmm. What people have to understand, and I am relatively new in the party, but this is a party that has been here, survived what people have called the worst dictatorship. You don't do that uh, uh, selling ice cream. But the party has evolved, and when you ask me about me rebranding, I told you the party was already on that path from 2016, rebranding, adjusting. Peter, you know what's happening? You know, we know where insults in this country happen? It's WhatsApp. It's not even Facebook. True. NPP is insulting more than UDP. I told you UDP TikTokers, when they came, they came from a, a young man from, from NPP. He's insulting people's mother on, on TikTok. And this, because he's NPP. I embraced him. The first day he came to my house, he said somebody advised him, if you go to Sabali's house, he'll beat you up. I received him with the UDP TikTokers. I encouraged the UDP TikTokers to, to, to work with him. In fact, they're doing community service. Our people are not the ones insulting. NPP is insulting as much or even more than UDP. What we know, and I've never heard NPP leadership telling their people not to insult. They insult me. They insult my mother. They, before the election, NPP threatened me. Their regional head in URR. He said, if I go into any Sarahule village, they should beat me up physically. The, the party never convened them. But it's only UDP, al Haji Usainu Dabo, constantly talking to some people whom we found out now never believe in our party because they've switched. Maybe it's because we've, we said enough is enough, no insult. They've switched to NPP now, and they are insulting us. We had a resolution on this issue. The party is on a path of transformation. It's transforming our young people. They are vibrant. They are energetic. We even own Gambia and TikTok. We are not insulting. We are, we are lightening up the message, and uh, we are cool. Be rest assured. Perfect timing.
exactly <laughs> half past ten. <laughs> you said you. we were never going to go <laughs> beyond that. Mumbudu Sabali, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for having and me. And Happy New Year to your uh, party leader. He's um, possibly one of the biggest fans of, um, of this program. I'm I sure he's there listening now. <laughs> I know that. I know that. Thank <laughs> you. Happy New Year, uh, um, uh, Lawyer Dabo, and Happy New Year to all uh, party heads. And um, Mumbudu Sabali, thank you once again for coming to the program. Thanks for having me, Peter. I think it's a blessing. You know, uh, When I was sitting before I came, your voice rose to a crescendo. <laughs> that gave me a Radio Gambia commentary moment. Beautiful. God bless you and preserve your golden amen, voice. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You've been listening to uh, Coffee Time with Peter Gomez, the first edition of 2023. And uh, what a privilege to have uh, Mumudu Sabali as our first guest of um, the new year. We'd like to thank all our sponsors, 